Good morning, everyone. I just got to put my other eyes on, otherwise I'm going to read the wrong speech here this morning. I've been given all of 14 minutes to speak to you, and you've got to understand I'm a guy that can speak all day. So I will try and remain disciplined and follow the text that I've prepared uh, for you. So it starts like this. Program director, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <laughs> welcome to the second, no, I'm not the program director. I've got to say welcome. I've got to say thank you for inviting me to be here. On a more serious note, I think this is a wonderful conference. It is also a very subversive conference because anybody that is working in the space of change will know that it is a career-limiting exercise <laughs> because people don't really want to change, do they? <laughs> but it's a wonderful privilege to rub shoulders with all of you and to feel the energy and the enthusiasm that you have for the future of your life and the future of our country. From the information I have on hand, it is evident that many of you are doing great things in your respective spaces, so well done. The Changemakers Conference here today is bold, as you will see from the uh, insignia, Conversations for Change. And I will attempt to make a contribution to that topic with a short speech which I've entitled, Be Brave and Rename Your Future. I want to briefly share two personal stories about change. The first relates to how I overcame a chronic condition, and the second is a lesson that I learned from a nine-year-old boy on the Cape Flats, and that nine-year-old boy was not me, it was someone else. But first things first, it is fortuitous and significant that the Change Maker Conference takes place during Women's Month in South Africa. A time for our nation to remember and acknowledge the significant role and contribution that women make in our personal lives and in the life of our nation. Of course, I would to be remiss of me not to mention at least two such women. The one is my mother who gave birth to me and she's passed on many years ago. And the other is the woman that gave birth to my children, also known as my wife and more about her in a moment, and I can scandal about her because she's not here today. And I, 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 I would beg that you don't tell her anything that I said here today. Who am I? Who is this guy called Reuben Richards? Well, it's a long story, and it's a confusing story, and when I tell my story to people, they conclude that I've got psychological problems. So I tend not to tell the story. But I'm an ordinary Cape Flats boy, uh, who managed to pass matric on the standard grade. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I was at school, we had the option higher grade or standard grade. I opted for standard grade. I'm a pretty standard kind of guy, you know. So uh, I, I worked as a, a clothing factory worker. I then became an artisan, uh, and I've, I've morphed into many different roles since then and I'm going to tell you about one of them in a moment. But all I can say about myself is that I'm very, very blessed. I feel very blessed, and I'm thrilled to be alive in South Africa at this point in its history. I am an apartheid generation baby. So I was born in 1960, not too long ago, so but an ordinary guy from the Cape Flats, but with an extraordinary determination to study my way to freedom. And for the record, I was born here in Cape Town. I'm married to one wife uh, for, the, for the past 31 years, I'm told. Uh, <coughs> thank you. I've got two children. My boy's name is Mpilo. He's 25 years old. And my daughter, her name is Nomsa. She's 20. And I've lived and worked and studied uh, internationally. Most of my clothes are in Cape Town. <laughs> now I can hear some of you thinking, 
because I, I got that kind of insight. You know, I can hear you thinking, did he, did he, did he just say his children's name is Impilo? In I, yeah, I know, it's you, I know. Yeah, 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 you're thinking. But, 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 this is, uh, he sounds colored. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I am talking to a South African audience, so I, I know, I know, I know. And I'll keep you guessing, I'm not going to put you out of your misery. <laughs> Now, let me tell you the story about my wife, as I pay tribute to her and other women. I'm not shy or nervous, neither am I ashamed, and I'm not even narcissistic when I say that I've achieved much in a short space of time. But I must hasten to add that none of my achievements would have been possible if it were not for my wife who believed in me. Let me explain. And let me explain it in the context of our theme, which is Conversations for Change. Way back in the late 1970s, the university and higher education system diagnosed me as having a disease, a chronic condition, tongue in cheek, called academically disadvantaged. A euphemism for being useless. In other words, I was not university material. Consequently, I had to wait till I was 26 years old before I was allowed into the university system. By that time, I had completed two apprenticeships and I was a qualified tradesman. For those of you that are interested in that kind of thing, I'm a fitter and turner by trade. So at the age of 26, I met the criteria to commence full-time university study <laughs> based on my age and not on my academic ability. Hey, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> and if age is going to get me in, then age is going to get me in. <laughs> now, many of you would know that when you are 26 years old in South Africa, you get an automatic age exemption. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of equivalent to the bachelor's pass. And in my day, it's the, uh, the matric exemption. So I got in on age. With the encouragement and financial support I received from my wife, and we got married just a year before, before that, I gave up my high-paying job as a tradesman, and I went to study at university full-time. I changed career track from my interests in mechanical engineering and a change to religion and the social sciences. Ten years later, ten years later, just shy of ten years later, I had accumulated and graduated with four degrees from three different countries. Thank you. I lived and studied in Switzerland, in the United States, and completed degrees there. My doctoral research was conducted in Hamburg, Germany, and so I was forced to learn German. So I'm not smart, I was just forced to learn the language. What can I say? Sprechen ein bisschen Deutsch, so what, that's just how it goes. So I graduated with a PhD in, uh, well, let me start that. I graduated with a PhD from the University of Cape Town. Now, where, I, I'm missing my vice chancellor that was here earlier because she needs to hear this. Because it is that university that diagnosed me with this chronic condition <laughs> and did not allow me to enter its corridors until I was 26 years old. So I take a moment today to acknowledge and say thank you to my wife for her support. And I acknowledge the role that other women play to make similar sacrifices for their partners and are unfortunately not acknowledged. So if this were a political rally, I would say, viva women, viva. viva. There we go. There you go. But this is not a political rally. So this is lead SA. So we're very sedate here, you know. So why do I tell you the story? You see, the, the lesson in that story is that my life changed dramatically because someone, and in this instance my wife, 
believed I could do it. I had a level of self-belief and lots of self-doubt. However, sometimes you just need one person to come alongside of you and to say, you know what? I believe in you. You can do it. And just those words could make all the difference. So let me ask you, when last did you tell someone that you genuinely believe in them? I suggest you try it. It may make a dramatic change in that person's life. So that's my first story this morning. My second story is a story I want to share with you since I've got five minutes left uh, to my speech. Uh, I mentioned, or I might not have mentioned to you earlier because I've jumped over this part of the introduction, that one of the things I do, in addition to writing books and making speeches and trying to be smart and funny, and in addition to irritating my wife, and I do that very well, I must say, I, mean, I do that very well, is that I engage in peace building and conflict mediation work between the rival gangs on the Cape Flats. And for that work, my foundation received the 2015 National Reconciliation Award for, from the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in our work that confronts the exclusion of people from the mainstream of our economy. Now, one afternoon, during one of these conflict mediation sessions with the gangs, we took a coffee break. I walked outside and I saw a nine-year-old boy running around the building as if he was waiting for someone. So I asked, oh, what are you doing here? I'm waiting for my daddy, was his reply. Now, now inside the building, I was engaged in hard peace negotiations with the top leadership of the five rival criminal gangs in that township. So clearly one of these leaders on the inside, this was his kid running around outside. In an effort to make small talk with a small kid, I asked the predictable question when you are around young children. And no, it wasn't, what is your daddy's name? No, it wasn't that, it wasn't that. I know that's what you would have asked. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What did I ask this kid? So tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up one day? That's what we should ask kids. This nine-year-old boy did not have to think. He answered immediately and spontaneously, as if he was waiting for someone to ask him the question. And he said to me, and I quote, I want to be a gangster. As if that was an honorable aspiration and career. That was his dream. That was his vision for the future. He wanted to be like his daddy. True story. This incident illustrates the core, of my, the core message of my speech today. And it reflects the single most important lesson for change makers in our society. And the lesson is this. For many of us, as for that nine-year-old kid, the only future that we know is the past that we come from. The only dream, the only vision for the future, this nine-year-old boy, the only vision he had that he could imagine was the past that he's come from. He expressed his vision to be a gangster with such confidence and excited anticipation. He had a role model whom he revered and respected. His father. Nothing wrong with that. His father was a decisive leader, a provider, a guy that makes things happen in the community, a guy that has a fancy car, fancy clothes, money, power, influence, 
Who wouldn't want a role model like that? This child's father, I think, probably should qualify for a change maker prize. But I can sense your discomfort. This conference is full of change makers today. It's an opportunity and a moment to reflect on the nature of change. And I wish I had more time to discuss some theories of change, but this is not the forum for it. But let me at least declare my bias and my presuppositional base. And it is this. You cannot change the past. We must acknowledge the past, of course, because if we don't, we will end up repeating the past. And this has particular relevance for those of us who come from a past that is drenched in trauma and violence which I suspect is most of us in South Africa. In more erudite language, let me describe my presuppositional base by using the words of Tess Morris Suzuki, a professor of Japanese history. She tends to use better words than I do. And she says, she says it as follows. We who live in the present did not create the violence and the hatred of the past. But the violence and the hatred of the past, to some degree, has created us. It formed the material world and the ideas with which we live, and will continue to do so unless we take active steps to unmake their consequences. In simple language, it's the title of my speech. We have to be brave and rename the future. Now, it's Saturday morning and you didn't come here to get a hectic lecture on theories of change. You, and I stand between you and tea time, so let me wrap up. <laughs> as change makers, we do well to remind ourselves that as we think of the future, we must make sure that we do not unwittingly repeat the past. I say this because old habits die hard. We are creatures of habit, and we often repeat things which we don't even realize are deeply embedded in our unconscious. This is where we get the expression from which says, history repeats itself. Well, at a more personal level, if you kind of around my age group, which is about 23, um, <laughs> you often hear people say, golly, you just like your mother. You're acting just like your father. Isn't that scary? The nine-year-old boy wanted to be just like his father. The mission of a change maker, I believe, is to create a better future than the past that we came from. As you do that, I wish you well, and I want to continue to challenge you. Be brave and rename the future. I thank you.